In this video, we will consider circular motion. Circular motion is not any sort of special motion, but it occurs so often that one develops certain techniques for handling it. The key thing to note is that when we develop new definitions, or what seem to be new terms, we are doing it because it makes the mathematics easier, and not necessarily because there's any new physics. Let us consider, for instance, a runner or even a ball on a hoop, for instance, right here. And we wanted to describe that object. We could, for instance, decide to draw an arrow from here, say, over to this point there. And that would be its initial position. Call that R sub A. And that ball would have a location, a certain value of X. Uh, so we could, for instance, this would be x sub a, and it would have a certain y coordinate, y sub a, and that's the way we've been describing things in Cartesian coordinates this semester. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, and certainly we could watch as the ball moves around this curved path to a new place, let's say over here at position b. And when it gets to position b, it'll have a new position vector, rb and it'll have a new x-coordinate and a new y-coordinate. Now because both the x and the y-coordinates change, we'll have to solve for equations, one equation for x, one equation for y. So this would mean that we would have at least two equations to solve. If you had, let's say, a solid wheel, where every point on the wheel could be considered to be a separate little ball, and there was, say, 10 to the 26 of these little points, then you would see that we'd have 2 times 10 to the 26 equations that we would have to solve to describe how a wheel moves. Now, while that may seem like a lot of equations, and it is, those equations aren't independent because the wheel is fixed. It's firm. Therefore, it moves where if one of the pieces on it rotates a certain uh, angle for, a, say, 30 degrees, then all of those points rotate 30 degrees. What we could say is that they're not independent, that they have what are called constraint equations, certain things that are holding the equations and making them connected. Well, what we want to do is we want to try to find out the least equations that are needed to describe something, for instance, this particle moving around in the soup. And we notice that if we decided instead of describing them by x and y, we described them by polar coordinates, we get a very different looking set of curves. For instance, this point right here, which we'll describe with my red pen, that could be described by a distance r and an angle theta sub a. And in its next position, when it gets to position B, because it's moving on a circle, it'll have the same radius, R, but it'll have a different angle, theta B. So if we worked in polar coordinates, where we did a radius and an angle, rather than having two equations to solve, we'd only have one, the angle, because the radius would be the same for every point on the circle. So we've solved half our work just by changing the polar coordinates. This is the reason that we decide not to use Cartesian coordinates in working problems involving rotation. It's kind of an example of where you don't try to fit a square peg in a round hole. This is a round problem. The object is moving on a curved space. We should use a coordinate system that is curved, polar coordinates. Now. Doing that is going to make the math simpler, but it's also going to come at some cost. We're going to have to come up with some new terms. So, key ideas. We use polar coordinates. The radius is constant. Only one angle, theta, changes. And this simplifies and makes the math simpler. We'll deal a lot more with this in detail in the chapter on rotation. This is just our first dealing with this idea of using polar coordinates. What about, we talked about position, what about velocity? Well, if you don't want to talk about velocity, let me draw the velocity at each one of these points. For the first green ball here, the velocity would have been going like this. And later on, when it got over to the purple spot, 
the velocity would have been going like this. The velocity vector is tangent to the path. It's always tangent to the path. It was tangent to the path when we dealt with in our earlier straight line motion. And that just comes from our definition of velocity. The velocity is the derivative of the position vector and that gives us the slope of the tangent line. Hence it's tangent to the path. Now because there's more than one type of velocity in rotational problems, we decide to be a little bit more specific and instead of just saying velocity, we actually say tangential velocity to remind ourselves that the velocity vector is tangent to the path. So by definition, the velocity vector is always tangent to the curve. We call it tangential velocity because we're trying to remind ourselves of that and because we have more than one type of velocity in these type of problems. So key thing here, there's nothing new about tangential velocity compared to what you learned previously. It's exactly the same thing. We'll just put this extra name kind of like we did with the instantaneous position. We put it there to remind us of something and that something is the velocity we're talking about is, is our old velocity which is tangent to the path. Now later on in the chapter on rotation when we start dealing with rigid bodies that are, have many particles, we're going to find it useful to talk about another type of velocity. A velocity that talks about how the angle changes. That's known as the angular velocity. And this is another reason why we call the other one tangential. If we just said velocity, the person wouldn't know, are you talking about how the angle changes? Or you're talking about how a particle moves. We want to be very specific. So when we're talking about the angle, we'll talk about angular velocity. When we're talking about how the object moves tangent to the path, We'll call it tangential velocity. Acceleration. Acceleration doesn't have any changes in going to rotation land. It's still going to be the time rate of change to the velocity vector, but we're not going to want to talk about the velocity in terms of x and y because we're working in terms of polar coordinates. What we want to do is talk about the velocity in terms of its other description. That is in terms of the way a polar vector would be talked about. A velocity vector like any polar vector has two parts. It has its magnitude, which we call its speed, and it has direction. So we're talking about a vector like this, V, but we want to know how long it is, and we want to know that angle, that is the direction, rather than in terms of its x-coordinate and its y-coordinate. So we're not interested in breaking it like this anymore. We're interested in working in the purple representation, its length and its angle. And so if either that of those two things changes, if the length of the velocity vector changes or the direction changes, then the vector has changed and we have acceleration. So if either changes, either one, the speed or the direction, then we have acceleration. Now, that means that we want to break the acceleration up into those two parts. Acceleration because there's a speed change and acceleration because there was a direction change. In straight line motion, you never had a direction change. It was just straight line. So you didn't have that type of acceleration. So we got a new type of acceleration in this problem. Let's first talk about acceleration due to speed changes. Tangential acceleration is the acceleration object feels due to a change in the object's speed. So if you're speeding up or you're slowing down, then you have tangential acceleration. This was the old acceleration we had earlier in the course. So this was the only type we discussed in straight line motion problems.
Now usually what has to happen in one of these problems is that they have to tell you the magnitude of the tangential acceleration or you do some sort of trigonometry to find it. And I'll show an example in a later video. But there is no formula usually for finding this. So I remind you of this fact. They usually tell you the magnitude of it. There's no formula. And then you have to use something else I'm going to teach you in a minute to find the direction of that. As mentioned already, tangential acceleration is the only acceleration you have in straight line motion. So actually, we can use this to help us. Let's consider a car here, right here. And this car has a certain velocity v. And this car is speeding up. So this would be, say, v initial. And some later time, say v2. And then the question is, which way does the change? Well, the change, delta V, occurred in that direction. And I remind you that acceleration vector always points in the direction of delta V. It points in the direction of the change. So since the change pointed in that direction, that's also the direction of A. Now, A could be different length depending on what time it took, but the acceleration vector points in the same direction as the velocity vector if, if the thing is speeding up. So speeding up, it points the same direction as the velocity vector. On the other hand, if you had an object slowing down, So here's v1. And some later time, you have a smaller vector v2. Then if I look at the change, the change, delta v, is in this direction. So that's also the direction of the acceleration. So it would be in the opposite direction. So we can determine the magnitude, how long the vector is, because it's either given to us or we use trig. But we'll find the direction <coughs> by just deciding whether the object is speeding up or slowing down. The same thing is true in rotation problems. If a wheel is speeding up, then the acceleration of that particle, tangential acceleration, is in the same direction as the velocity of that particle. If it's slowing down, it points in the opposite direction of the velocity of the particle. All right, that covers this part of the video. We'll come back and deal with the rest of this subject in the next video.